This morning we're again uh, working in chapter 4 of Acts. <clears throat> Last uh, couple of weeks ago we talked about some of the principles of handling persecution. And uh, as Peter and John are facing the Sanhedrin, and we looked at being submissive during persecution, being filled with the Holy Spirit to enable us through persecution, and being aggressive and seizing the opportunities that God provides through that. And this morning we're going to be looking at verses 14 through 22 to chapter 4. I'm going to read that in here in a second. As we see the significance of being obedient to God at all costs. The Sanhedrin recognized Peter and John's boldness and their courage and their wherewithal with Jesus' authority and truth in handling the Old Testament scriptures. And they witnessed the miracle right standing before them, this man who'd been lame for 40 years and now he's walking and dancing around and jumping up and down. And looking at verse 14, and seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. But when they ordered them to go out inside, outside, out of the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, what shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to any man in this name. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking what we have seen and heard. And when they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which they might punish them on account of the people, because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. For the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. The promise Jesus gave to his apostles to give them utterance and wisdom, and I want to read that. That's in Luke 21, back a few pages, the same author of this book. Luke 21, verses 15 through 19. Jesus is speaking to the disciples. For I will give you utterance and wisdom, which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. But you will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all on account of my name. Yet not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance you will gain your lives. Jesus encouraged them with that. And here in Acts we're seeing that happen. We're seeing these truths being fulfilled. The Sadducees believed in the written law, very much so. And Peter and John had broken no laws. And so with this miracle standing right in front of them, they couldn't deny it, the scripture says, but they didn't accept it either. As from Jesus of Nazareth. And here they were a living example of Jesus' words in John 3, 19 that says, The light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds are evil. They knew. They knew what they saw, but they refused to accept it, just like they rejected Jesus, his resurrection. The Sanhedrin was reliving its worst nightmare. They had executed Jesus for claiming to be the Messiah. And Jesus' followers were going everywhere now, repeating those claims and proclaiming irrefutable proof that Jesus had risen from the dead. And they performed a miracle to prove Jesus is alive and was the Messiah. 
And the scripture says there that all the evidence stands against the Sanhedrin. All the evidence. And so the only thing they could do was command them not to speak anymore about the man Jesus. And Peter and John refused to obey the Sanhedrin. They refused to obey that command because they appealed to them to the higher court, didn't they? By asking the question whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to men rather than to God. <laughs> Again, Peter, he turned the indictment right back on them. Obey man or God? And the answer is, God wins. <laughs> Today, obey your government? Yes. But when the commands of God conflict with government, God comes first. He should come first. And Peter and John refused to obey the Sanhedrin, but they showed them respect. They did not argue with them, did they? But respectfully explained that they could not stop speaking what they have seen and heard. Seen and heard. Again, there's a they're witness to the miracles. They were eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrected body. They saw him die on the cross. We can't stop speaking what we've seen and heard. And the Sanhedrin released them, threatened them, but released them. Why? Because all the people, the scripture says, were glorifying God for what had happened. The man had a birth defect for 40 years and was healed immediately and completely. So there was no way they could have faked this. Everybody knew this man. Be submissive. Be spirit-filled. Be aggressive in seizing the opportunities to speak on the Lord's behalf and be obedient to God at all costs. Look at verse 23. Here we see the need to be committed to fellowship. And when they had released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. After Peter and John are released, they returned to their own companions. And the scripture is kind of vague there about who this group is. It might have been part of the original group that met in the upper room. We don't know. Some of the apostles, very likely, but a group that would receive comfort and encouragement through Peter and John's testimony, and vice versa. It goes both ways. It would help Peter and John to even grow stronger, too, in their desire to speak on behalf of the Lord. It seems that external pressures from the outside reveals if today's church is truly united or pretending to be united with true doctrine. COVID, COVID has a way of bringing us together or splitting us up as a church, doesn't it? And I'm convinced it's brought us closer together. Please be committed to fellowship, to fellowship and be thankful Look at verses 24 through 28 in this passage. And when they heard this, what did they do? They lifted up their voices to God with one accord and said, O oh Lord, it is thou who does make the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that's in them, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, thy servant, did say, Why did the Gentiles rage? And the peoples devised futile things, and the kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city they were gathered together against thy holy servant Jesus, whom thou didist anoint, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever thy hand and thy purpose predestined to occur. Peter and John returned not in a state of fear and dejection, but of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving and praise. They lifted up their voices to God with one accord and said, O oh Lord, 
It is thou who didst make the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that's in them. That phrase that's used there, O Lord, despotes, is the uncommon title in the New Testament. It's what we would use in our English translation as master. Now, a slave knows their master. And whatever the master says to do, the slave does. And we're slaves. Slaves of Jesus Christ. And our master is the Lord and he loves us. This really appears five times, five other times in the New Testament. Lord, I know it's several times here in this chapter, but all together, five major times. It's where we get our English word despot, which means king, ruler with absolute power. Back in the old days, the king could have your life by coming to him without an appointment. <laughs> Remember that? Even Rahab, not Rahab, but Esther came to the king and he, she knew she could be killed without making an appointment first. This is this word, Lord, unlimited power. And it's interesting that Peter was faced with opposition. And he takes comfort in reminding himself that God is sovereign. God is in control, complete control of everything. And he quotes Psalm 2 here, verses 1 and 2. And he includes Herod, doesn't he? He includes Pontius Pilate. He includes the Gentiles and the people of Israel. We're all used. All of them were used by God for his divine purpose. And he finishes that in verse 28 with a predestined occurrence. It was God's plan. And he used everything that happened for God's plan. Having done their worst... They merely succeeded in fulfilling God's eternal plan. And maybe that's what's going on in America today. It's the worst. We've seen it in years. And maybe it's God's plan. This didn't take God by surprise. It doesn't take God by surprise today. It was all a part of our Lord's eternal plan here. Nothing happens in the universe apart from his permission. Nothing Nothing happens that can defeat his purpose for his creation. And last, we need to be desirous of greater boldness. Be desirous of greater boldness when persecution comes. Look at verse 29 through 31. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that thy bondservants may speak thy word with all confidence. Let us extend thy hand to heal and signs and wonders to take place through the name of thy holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. What a prayer. They asked the Lord to take note of those who make threats and grant thy Bond servants to speak his word with all confidence. And notice they didn't ask for protection. They didn't ask for a place to hide. But for more courage. More courage to proclaim God's truth. The very thing that they were ordered not to do by the Sanhedrin. And they prayed that God would continue to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of his holy servant, Jesus. And in verse 31, God answered their prayer pretty quick, didn't he? The place where they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. And sometimes when God answers prayers, there's a physical sign that comes before it. The earth shakes or the tremble or the sun doesn't come out, you know. And then there's this Holy Spirit. In Acts 2, 4, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke in tongues. And in Acts 4, 8, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and that time they didn't speak in tongues. And here, they're filled with the Holy Spirit, but for boldness, to give them boldness to strength. Here they are empowered again by the Holy Spirit as this occasion demanded. 
So in the days and the months that followed this first opposition by religious leaders, the apostles kept right on proclaiming the good news. And to wrap this up this morning, these seven steps to handle persecution from a Christian point of view, from Peter and John's experience, to be submissive, be filled with the Spirit, be aggressive in seizing the opportunity that God puts in your path, be obedient to God at all costs. That's probably the hardest one. To be committed to fellowship. Don't isolate yourself. Be with others. Be thankful. Thankful that God will use you. And be desirous of greater boldness in your life and walk. Paul said he was the chief of sinners. The chief of sinners. He had every education there was. He was smart. And he thought of himself in that humble means in that way. The early church faced opposition. And instead of withdrawing to compromise the gospel, it became bolder and bolder and bolder. And the persecution also served to draw this congregation, this group of people together to the Lord, to each other and to the Lord. And this happened over and over and over through time. How prepared are we? How prepared are we for the next created pandemic, if you will? What's at the core of our being? What's at the core of your being? What's inside of you? The Bible is a mirror that shows us what we truly like inside of us at our core of our being. And why does the Bible do that? Because it's exactly this ordinary power that God has given it to reveal things to us, to reveal truths to me that Daryl might read and it's going to reveal something about him or something else. It's specific. It's individual. And when you read the scripture, it moves something inside of you that, where'd that come from? I didn't see that before. It's a mirror. And it shows to face to face with God Almighty. Do you remember the parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16? Through this intriguing story, Jesus tells us that the Bible brings the confused and the hurting into relationship with him with God. It says there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and he lived in luxury every day. And at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. That's what it says in the scripture. Even the dogs came to lick his sores. Lazarus and the unnamed rich man represent the classic contrast between those who have much and those who have nothing. But notice death comes to both, the rich and the poor. And so it came to Lazarus and the rich man. And after death, their positions reversed. Lazarus was carried by angels to Abraham's side, the scripture says. Well, the rich man remained in torment, indeed. It's interesting to note that the rich man was well known in life, but it's Lazarus who's given a name, and we never know the name of the rich man. The rich man's thirst burned, the scripture says, hot. And he wanted Lazarus, please, Lazarus, would you just ask Lazarus to go dip his finger in some water and bring it back so I can touch my tongue? In order to cool it, that's not possible. And the man then approached Abraham with a second request. And he said if nothing could be done with, about his situation, he wanted to warn his five brothers who were still alive to change their ways and avoid his fate. And he asked that he might raise from the dead himself, if God would raise him from the dead, to warn his brothers and the dialogue follows provides a great insight to the crucial role the Bible plays in life. And the scripture says that Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. 
Let them listen to them. There's the Bible. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from dead goes to them, they will repent. And Abraham said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even when someone raises from the dead to speak to them. How often we think like the rich man. In essence, Jesus is telling him that the copy of the Bible on his brother's coffee table would be more convincing and exciting than the ghost of their dead brother showing up. After all, such an appearance would later be interpreted, eh, that was a bad dream, or a nightmare, or a result of indigestion. But the Bible has always been there to read, recheck, ponder, meditate upon. In other words, the Bible conveys a dose of reality far more potent than a ghost, whether coming from a place of torment or from Hollywood. God speaks to us through the Bible. Have we let him, have we let him transform us? Are we producing fruit of Christ's character? Are we prepared for our times of struggle and persecution from the enemy? Decide today. Let God's word speak to your heart. And if you haven't asked Jesus to come into your life, to repent of your sins, to let him begin to transform you, your whole life, your being, your purpose. Prepare for eternity. Don't wait for it to come. Be prepared for it. For our trials and our struggles and our hardships, be prepared for them. So often believers in Christ go through those trials and struggles, and what does that do? It makes them stronger. It's like Peter and John. It didn't make them weaker. And it will make us stronger as we go through those. What the future brings, I don't know. We don't know. But we know it's not going to be fun and easy because Jesus said that. He said, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you as his children. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you, God, for the reminders today. We thank you for Peter and John's devotion, their commitment, their determination. And Lord, God forbid that persecution will come, but when it does come here, Lord, help us to be strong. Help us to be prepared as Peter and John were. And we can read this and reread this and study it and apply it to our walk today with you. That we will be bolder. We will trust you, even when it may cost us everything. Father, we love you. And if there's someone here this morning that's never made that commitment, I pray you touch their heart and their life and give them the strength to, and determination to live for you, to love you as you love us, to take our, to, as you have taken our place on the cross. We thank you, God, for your grace and mercy that you extend to us every day. Every breath we take is a gift from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.